being recorded. Welcome to Netscout's voice and video conferencing, how to streamline rollouts and assure optimal service delivery. My name is Luke Baraldi, account manager here at Amex Group, host of today's presentation. Amex Group is a federal small business that provides technology products and services to the public sector. We're one of the fastest growing private companies in the DC metro area, and since our founding in 1997, have sold over $2 billion in technology products and services to every federal government agency and many more state and local organizations nationwide. Our presentation today will run about an hour, including time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions into the pod to the left of your main screen. I'll be collecting them for question Q&A period at the end. Also to your left are downloadable files that may be of interest to you and a link to more information about today's topic. This presentation is being recorded and an archive link will be emailed to you within the next couple of days. Today's presentations include a live software demonstration. Please note the toggle button near the bottom left of the presentation screen that reads full screen. At the time of the demonstration, you will be invited to click on this toggle in order to better experience it. At the end of the demonstration, you'll be asked to toggle back from this view in order to enter any questions you may have into the Q&A pod or to download any documents that are available. Today's speaker is Thomas Casey, Senior Solutions Architect at Netscout, at Netscout Systems. Thomas Casey has more than 15 years' experience in performance management of network systems and applications. For the past six years, Tom has been developing best practices for the monitoring and management of voice and video systems, including telepresence, SIP trunking, soft clients, and streaming video. Today, his work as a global technician consultant for, the, for Netscout includes solution architecture design, as well as product presentation, implementation, and training. Also on the line is Brad Calderone, Senior Account Manager for DHS, FBI, DOD, and Combatant Command at Netscout Systems, and he's been there for the last seven years. I'd like to turn this over to Brad and Tom, and thank you for attending. Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Calderon, and first I want to thank and welcome everyone who's attending this morning. We sincerely look forward to um, providing you with a large portion of our one of our latest additional features we've added on to the uh, NetScout solution, which of course is our ingenious voice and video manager or unified communications. So we look forward to this presentation and answering all questions at the end of it. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Thomas Casey. Well, hi folks. Uh, my name is Tom Casey. Um, as, uh, as you have heard, I've got a long background in, in networks and applications. And in more recent years, I've been explicitly devo devoted to voice and video and management, management of, of those unified communications technologies. Um, they certainly have run the gamut from soft clients to uh, SIP trunking to uh, secure networks and uh, telemedicine, the, the various uh, flavors of voice and video that are, that are out there in the world today. And I, pretty much I've seen all of them uh, from early days on to uh, production level implementations around the globe. Um, so certainly any questions you have about uh, your, your needs, your the te technologies you're considering using, uh, the kinds of headaches that you may have encountered, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that may come up as we, as we go along. Now, what we're really talking about are a variety of uh, technologies that, that may or may not interact. Certainly, they will share some fundamental infrastructure. So when we're talking about multi-party video conferencing or point-to-point -point telephony, uh, VoIP telephony, handoff from VoIP telephony to traditional uh, PSTN networks, as well as soft clients, so embedded voice and video uh, technologies in PC applications. Uh, we're talking about all of these at the same time. These new technologies uh, offer new promise. Uh, there are new capabilities, new ways for us to communicate, new ways to, to work together. Um, at the same time, they introduce new requirements, and certainly they introduce new risks. And this is something that uh, NetScout's voice and video manager is designed to help you address. And what we see in the, in the world today are a variety of vendors offering sometimes competing technologies, sometimes very complementary technologies. But certainly what becomes a challenge for IT organizations is interoperability uh, uh, questions. You know, can these different devices, uh, different, uh, different vendors interact, interoperate uh, successfully? 
At the same time, we've got workers who increasingly are working from home or working at remote sites, so contact centers and call centers that might be handling uh, essentially customer service. Um, managing those remote workers and making sure that they're productive, making sure that the technology doesn't become uh, a burden to the way that they do their jobs is increasingly a challenge. All while, we've developed multiple IT silos silos, where we've got different folks who are devoted to the network, and perhaps a different team that may be devoted to voice or to video or to both of those. Um, allowing what we, what we find often challenging is clear and uh, uh, definitive accountability for those different, different silos in the IT organization. Does a performance issue uh, land in the lap of the, the network guys or the network ops guys? or does it land in, in the lap of someone who's responsible for the, the UC technologies? What we find is that with this increasing complexity and with these increased challenges, traditional networking tools that measure things like packet loss or jitter or network latency are not enough. They're insufficient. Well, certainly I, I admit that packet loss and jitter and latency are fundamental to knowing whether or not voice or video uh, services are, are healthy, they don't go nearly far enough. So there's a whole slew of real world issues that affect the end user that have nothing to do with the network and nothing to do with packet loss and jitter. At the same time, our users complain um, in ways that often aren't particularly helpful. So we human beings tend to complain on the first, first or second try or we complain on the 10th try after we've, we've uh, grown fed up with a technology, uh, it might be that we don't even complain. We just try something the first time and, and then don't try it again. Uh, if it was an unpleasant experience the first time, our expectations are, 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 then, are, are then disappointed. We don't try again. Uh, we might not even log a, a call ticket or a problem ticket to report the issue. Uh, at the same time, when we do complain, we complain in ways that IT organizations find challenging. So I might say, he was muffled. Uh, it's hard to hear him. Um, my, the people I'm speaking to complain that I'm not loud enough. That's a pretty, pretty clear one. But, it, but it's difficult to know whether the problems that users encounter are based on endpoints, the phone, the gateway, or on the network. And their descriptions, their anecdotal evidence, often aren't enough for IT organizations to know what they need to do to fix the situation. So there are, in, in this uh, environment of multi-vendor, multi-technology, the source of trouble has grown. So the, the possible uh, misconfigurations or faulty devices has really exploded. So while IP packet transmission problems are key, there are things that we certainly need to monitor. What's terrifically important is to monitor both the endpoint and the network whether those are gateways or session border controllers, whether they're, uh, they're phone, soft clients or hard phones, there are a slew of real world issues. Misconfigured echo cancelers at either end of the pipe. Um, inappropriate levels for voice, uh, crackle and pop, uh, noise, noise that's introduced by the end, endpoint device. These are symptoms or behaviors that do not stem from the network at all. The, the IP network cannot create these acoustic behaviors. Um, they, can, they can perhaps make them worse by introducing delay, but the source of the trouble for things like echo and noise are the, the endpoint device, whether it's a gateway, whether it's a conferencing bridge, or whether that's a phone. So a true service assurance solution for, for voice or for video technologies requires complete coverage requires a balance of cost versus benefit. So it, it might be um, <clears throat> finding, finding optimal locations in the network where instruments can provide insight into, the, into the, the source of trouble. So identifying a strategy of deployment uh, that allows monitoring, that allows management, uh, and doesn't leave the IT organization uh, with a, a partial view or, or, or no view at all. So what we really need is meaningful data and actionable data, data that, that can identify the source of trouble and can, can provide insight into, 
into whether or not that device is merely misconfigured or whether it, it needs, to be, needs to be replaced. So what we're talking about then is voice and video manager. This new, new product from NetScout is, has in fact existed for about 10 years now. Uh, I've worked with it for about six. Um, it's been relabeled the, as part of an acquisition of a company called Cytechnics. Uh, it's been relabeled the voice and video manager. And <clears throat> essentially what it's offering is real-time measurement of voice and video quality tied to the user experience. So I think many of us uh, on the call today may have, uh, may have some experience with things that are called MOS scores, mean opinion scores. Uh, in, in, the, in the past, those mean opinion scores have had limited connection to the actual user experience. So um, the aim with a mean opinion score was to calculate uh, packet loss and jitter objectively and produce a measurement of health as to whether or not that voice or video quality were acceptable. Unfortunately, because that's a very limited slice of the things that affect the voice quality, there's often a, a strong disconnect from, from, by the, from the user experience to those metrics, packet loss and jitter. The, what I mean by that, or to, be, or to be more clear, it may very well be that there is no packet loss, that there is no, no jitter in an environment, that the network health is perfectly fine and yet users are having uh, terrible voice quality. So <clears throat> by not taking into account all of the parameters that affect our user experience, um, this, there's historically been a disconnect between the MOS score and what users are actually reporting. So we aim to, we aim to fix that. <clears throat> voice and Video Manager provides real-time dashboards with automatic or automated diagnostics uh, by drill down to individual calls, individual streams, while at the same time offering higher level, business level reporting. To get to the real user experience, we need to expand our, our perspective. Certainly packet loss and jitter and network latency, those fundamental measurements of network congestion, are key and, and, and uh, fundamental to our approach. But we don't stop there. We take into account the performance capabilities, the error concealment capabilities of the endpoints, whether, whether it be a gateway, a soft client, a hard phone, a conferencing bridge. We will, we will understand the error concealment intelligence built into those endpoint devices. So when we produce a, a mean opinion score, that mean opinion score takes into account not merely the packet loss and jitter on the network, but also the, whether or not the devices at either end can cope with such a thing. You know, if, if I've got a 1% packet loss rate, can my phone cope with that? Is that within the specification for the device to be able to handle that kind of network performance? So that we produce a mean opinion score that really is tied to your experience or my experience on a phone call. We don't stop there. We go further, and we open up the packets that are delivered to analyze the application performance. And so in this case, what we're doing is reconstructing the audio waveform. And, and in so doing, we're able to look at aspects of the voice experience, the voice or video experience, to understand the listening quality and conversational quality. So listening quality is essentially, a, uh, for lack of a better word, would be voice clarity. Is the voice from this phone clear and, and understandable? while conversational quality really pertains to timing between us. So it's a bi-directional measurement that involves can you and I, given the timing on our call, successfully conduct a conversation. So it might be that the, the round trip delay is such uh, that I think that you've disappeared and I stop my conversation to, to ask, are you there? Can you still hear me? Um, that's a conversational quality issue. It might be that my voice is clear but it's the timing between us that becomes a problem. So <clears throat> Voice and Video Manager is built to take these different perspectives into account. And, and as a result, they produce three different sorts of MOS scores. There's a, a mean opinion score that measures the network impact. 
did packet loss or jitter or, or network latency produce a problem for voice quality or for video quality, while uh, at the same time producing an LQ MOS, a listening quality MOS, that measures that, one, that, that unidirectional uh, voice clarity from each of the endpoints on a call. And then there's a CQ MOS, a conversational quality MOS, that measures the, the conversational experience. So when, when it, what this allows us to do is divide and conquer. So it may be that network operations teams care about the network delivery, the network transport. And so if there's a problem in that regard, they, get, they have data that allows them to diagnose uh, the problems that come from their part of the world. While <clears throat> listening quality and conversational quality issues might be handed to those who are responsible for the endpoints, the phones or the gateways or the conferencing bridges. So I won't go deeply into this, but what I would say about video is that while our approach is similar to the way we handle voice transport, voice, voice, I, voice over IP, video over IP has some unique characteristics and some unique behaviors that we're sensitive to. And that involves, in particular, the built-in intelligence and adaptation that video conferencing, video streaming uh, can result in. So new technologies in video allow the endpoint to detect network congestion, to be, to be sensitive to, to packet loss or jitter, and to adjust on the fly by reducing the media bit rate, uh, by changing the frame rate, by adopting a new, a new video codec, all mid-call. And uh, so that was, uh, that was a challenge for us, but it was one that we've addressed over, over several years now, uh, where we can uh, detect both the adaptive behavior of the video conferencing or video endpoints and their restoration. So when the, when the packet loss or jitter uh, ceases, those devices can now scale back. They can, they can then uh, restore uh, th full throughput uh, for, voice qu for video quality. Um, one wants to be sure that that adaptation is healthy, that uh, the video endpoints are correctly responding to the network conditions um, and that they are scaling back when, when the network permits. Um, this product allows you to see both both behaviors, the, the, the bandwidth throttling along with uh, the restoration of, of quality. So as you might imagine, um, there are situations where we see packet loss and jitter that trigger video endpoints uh, to reduce throughput and to, to, to perhaps even change codec. This product allows you to first see the network condition as well as the application layer response to that condition and to, to know whether or not it's a priority to fix that network, to, to address that network problem or not. Uh, essentially, it allows one to, to identify priorities uh, for their operations team. So in summary, we're talking about uh, the difference between IPQOS or IPQOS versus quality of experience. And quality of experience requires this broader view. Packet loss and jitter late, network latency, certainly fundamental, but we don't stop there. We take into account echo and round trip delay, application layer delay, noise, and problems with speech level. Is, is the voice too loud or too soft? Speech distortion, which, 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 which may occur um, when transcoding occurs. It may be that one part of the network or, or, or traffic coming in from the traditional wireless or PSTN networks um, require transcoding to a, a codec that's appropriate for IP networks. The act of, of transcoding, transcoding can produce loss and distortion. So a, a distortion essentially is mangled speech. And um, if, if uh, by accident, inadvertent, uh, multiple transcoding occurs, that's tremendously destructive to, to voice quality. So as you might imagine, uh, local networks might be using uh, G711. Uh, they send the, the, the voice over a wide area network and service provider may uh, utilize, may transcode down to a lesser quality, less, uh, less uh, bandwidth intensive codec called G729. The, the enterprise or the organization on the other side 
may then transcode back up to G711 uh, in, a, in, a, in an ineffective way. Uh, but the act of translation three times can be terrifically destructive to, to voice quality. And so uh, that's often the source of uh, the voice distortion that we measure. So the, the end of <clears throat> the result of all of this, in summary, is, the, is, is that we're able to produce metrics and overall views into the end user experience for both voice and for video. We do this for every user, for every session, and every endpoint that we have, in, that we have access to. Now, the voice and video manager product is, di is divided into different perspectives, different GUIs. The first, in the center, is what we call the monitor screen. Essentially, this is a real-time unified communications uh, dashboard. So you're able to look at all of your services in a single, with a single pane, pane of glass uh, to understand uh, are they healthy. And if they're not healthy, one can then move into a troubleshooting mode and into a different interface uh, that simplifies and makes it easy to isolate where the problems are coming from to identify user groups that are affected that downstream as well as the uh, behind-the-scenes source of trouble. At the same time, we provide a couple different perspectives for different audiences. The service desk is designed to use very simple English for folks who are not expert in, in voice or video quality so that frontline help desk engineers can, can identify problems that, that have affected a particular user or a particular phone, a particular conference session, to understand the, the base, in basic terms what's wrong with that traffic, what's wrong with that experience, so that they can arm a problem ticket uh, that, a, that a, a, a second or third tier engineer might, might delve, delve, delve more deeply into. At the same time, there's a, there's a proactive view that permits um, <clears throat> Uh, responding teams or responsible teams to see problems in the make, to see uh, historically, is there a problem with performance um, with a particular device or particular network segment uh, that perhaps users haven't yet complained about, uh, but that uh, we can detect uh, th there's a growing problem or a problem on the make, and this allows responding teams to see that before it's become a critical issue. And lastly, the reporting package allows folks to see, see data from their perspective. So uh, reports that are useful for operations and for troubleshooting, while, uh, while others, account managers, site managers, service managers, uh, can see higher level views for the overall health of, of their service delivery. Now, <clears throat> we get this data from a variety of sources, but the primary source that we use is what I might call mid-network monitoring, where we use a NetScout InfiniStream probe to capture packets and analyze those packets locally so that what gets transmitted over the wire from InfiniStream to the voice and video manager is merely the analyzed results. Now, some of you may already have uh, InfiniStreams in place. Our aim is to allow folks to use their existing uh, infrastructure, their existing invest investment with NetScout to provide this voice and video analysis. But it does require uh, more modern flavors of InfiniStream in order to support the software analytics. At the same time, however, in, in environments that use Microsoft Link or IBM Same Time, we can, pro we can obtain performance metrics right from the endpoint. And it, it, we've partnered with IBM and with, with uh, Microsoft to embed our analytics in their soft clients. So there are some environments uh, in Finistream appliances are not required. In fact, they could, uh, they, there are some customers who monitor their voice and video quality right from the endpoint. And now, in a moment, I'm going to launch the, the live product. But before I do that, I want to talk about uh, where, 
where our monitoring instruments usually end up. Because what I do, that's a big part of my role these days, is to help folks define solution architectures. More often than not, folks have a large number of sites, some of the sites quite small, where it would not be cost effective to locate a monitoring instrument at the, at the far end of the, of the flow. But what we do see is that by, by analyzing call flows, session flows for voice or for video, we can often see that there are strategic locations in the network that provide high value. So as you might imagine, video conferencing may have uh, multiple, uh, multiple units distributed across the network. And, and more often than not, we're seeing uh, the use of MPLS cores. So what we might do, I, forgive me, there's, uh, for video conferencing, uh, you may have point-to-point -point traffic from site to site, but, but there are often uh, a, a, a number, a small number of locations, data centers, where conferencing units sit. And those conferencing units provide high value because they provide insight into the upstream performance from remote site or from headquarters to the data center uh, to understand the network health and the application delivery from a single point of monitor. So here we've got point-to-point -point traffic between two sites, between uh, headquarters and, and a smaller remote site. And in this diagram, we've got a, a combination of the two. We've got point-to-point -point traffic, and we have point-to-multi-point -point traffic uh, via the MCU. Now, the way we might instrument here would be like this, where we certainly almost invariably locate a monitoring instrument and an appliance um, at at or near uh, the conferencing bridges. We may also choose to place a monitoring instrument at headquarters uh, because there's lots of communication from remote sites to the headquarters and it becomes a point of centralization or point of aggregation uh, that provides a lot of insight into what's happening at, at remote locations. And then lastly, uh, there may be things like contact center or sites like contact centers or other significant locations uh, that provide an aggregated hub or an aggregate hub uh, for traffic flows, whether, whether they be voice or for video. But most of the time, I, I don't recommend that we put probes ubiquitously everywhere. Instead, I look for high value proposition. Where, where does it make sense to put, a, put an instrument to monitor the flows? And lastly, we might locate a, what's called a data collector. A data collector gathers data from third-party sources like Microsoft or IBM same time, or in some environments like Cisco Call Manager or Acme Packet Session Border Controllers. Because those, those Cisco Call Manager, Acme Packet, um, signaling flows from Avaya provide us uh, information about phone numbers and conference IDs. So for a video conferencing solution, this is what, this is where we might instrument, and the results allows us to produce visualizations of network, network and application performance issues as illustrated here, where we can see the relationship, the logical relationship between the endpoints. In this case, we've got two video conferencing units, two monitoring locations, so two, two infinite streams or two probes. And this allows us to draw conclusions. If we, in, in, this, in this example, um, we can see that we had a packet loss issue. And that packet loss issue can clearly be tied to the WAN transport. Because of, the, because of where we've placed the probes, we know that the packet loss, or we can conclude, that the packet loss that we, that we measured occurred across the wide area network and not in the local LAN. Um, at the same time, we don't have application layer performance issues uh, that would uh, 
So we've narrowed the boundary on the nature of the problem. We've identified the fundamental source of the problem and put some boundaries on, on what team needs to respond. So the folks who are responsible for WAN transport um, or for, for the, the wide area network health would respond to a, a problem like this. So if we're instrumented as the endpoint, in the case of something like Microsoft uh, Link or uh, IBM Same Time, we can see the end the endpoint performance. Um, this allows us a little less diagnostics about where the problem occurred, but it allows uh, a higher level view into is the service quality acceptable, and if not, why was it bad? In this case, we, again, we've got a packet loss issue. By combining these together, we get very precise information about just where the problem occurred and who's affected by it. So it's, uh, yeah. So what I'd like to do now is bring up uh, the uh, live product, the voice and video manager. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Uh, so perhaps uh, as we get to the end of the uh, the demonstration, we can uh, we can open up for questions. This is Voice and Video Manager. It's a web, it utilizes a web front end to a back end database. And that back end, that back end database, as I described, gathers together and correlates all of the metrics that we've uh, produced for each of the sessions and, and, and voice streams that we measured uh, out in the network. By default, no data is shown. So I'm going to select uh, a view. Now this filtering mechanism on the right allows me to slice through my data. So I may have gathered data on millions of calls and hundreds of thousands of video sessions. Uh, this filtering mechanism allows me to slice through my network in a variety of ways. I can look at things from, uh, from an address range point of view, so physical subnets. I can also look at uh, sites and endpoints that are grouped together geographically. Uh, so logically, I can produce uh, organizational views that allow me to see whether I've got patterns of behavior uh, that affect a particular group or that are coming from a particular point in the location. You know, I think you'll see this in just a minute. In this case, I'm going to look at all of my traffic. I'm looking in a single view in the central area where we labeled key quality metrics. I can see the overall health for all of my technologies, soft clients, hard phones, uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing, uh, streaming video. I can see that all in one place. Um, so I can see at the top level IP transport measurements, video IP and voice IP. Essentially, what did the network do to uh, damage or, or maintain my voice or video quality? In this case, by mousing, uh, certainly the average at 3.9 or 3.8 is respectable on a scale of one to five. Uh, anything above 3.5 tends to be acceptable. Um, 3.8 perhaps for video. So on average, we are healthy. But if I look at the distribution, I can see that 20% of my video traffic is critically degraded or in red. So um, that certainly is worrisome. The averages can be terrifically misleading. The distribution, I think, uh, is probably more meaningful to know whether uh, whether or not I've got a situation that, that needs a uh, response. So 20% of my video uh, traffic is critically bad, and that's on the basis of some near nearly 3,000 streams. And I see similar issues uh, with voice. Voice being a little less sensitive uh, to some of the behaviors that we're that we might measure in in, in terms of packet loss or jitter. Uh, we can see that 13% of the voice traffic is is affected by the network. At the same time, we've got a layering of effects, a layering of problems. We can see that 10%, um, nearly 11% of my traffic, uh, or rather, 10 per, nearly 11% of traffic with echo had critically bad echo. So that, that indicates to me that we may have an echo, echo cancelers in, at certain points in the network that are misconfigured or, or, or faulty. Uh, that are not not handling echo in the way that they should. And then lastly, perhaps less significantly, we've got a, 
a 5% of my traffic is degraded in some way due to voice level. So the voice is too loud or too soft. We can see that the average around negative 26 decibels is, is pretty healthy, but there's a percentage of traffic, perhaps too much, too high a percentage of traffic where voice level is a, a problem. Now, in this same uh, GUI, I can see in the left-hand corner what's called the event summary. This event summary is look, utilizing the historical data that we keep to identify ongoing, repetitive, or systemic issues. That, that call for some attention. And so um, I can see that at the top of the list are IP transport issues uh, in traffic from Denver and, uh, and to Boston. So that, that gives me a very, uh, very helpful information right from the, right from the start. Thir thirdly, and this is an ordered list, uh, there is a significant problem with echo via my Toronto gateway coupled with a delay problem from Toronto Gateway. And, and in fact, those are separate behaviors, but together they amount to a critical issue where uh, you've got high echo or mismanaged echo and, and large round-trip delay. That round-trip delay really makes the echo problem much worse. And so from this point of view, I can go from the high-level view, and I, and I might uh, slice through the, the technologies in, in any which way I like. I can say, Show me Boston, uh, and let's just look at uh, IP, uh, IP telephony. So let's, uh, let's change the perspective. We will, we will go from traffic from Denver. Take a look. So for, for, for voice traffic from Denver, I can see that some 60, nearly 60% 60 of the traffic is degraded, so yellow or red and 24% of it is critically so. And from this point of view, I can drill into that to examine what's happening in Denver. And here I'm, here I'm now looking at uh, metrics at a site level. I can see my different locations. I can see the world from a hierarchical point of view. You can see in, in, my, in my environment, I just have a few locations. I've got Boston, London, Dubai, Denver, uh, and, and some devices in Toronto as well as folks who are external to my network, uh, remote workers who may access, who may access my network via, via VPN to a data center. But in this case, what we're investigating is the uh, Denver performance. And if I drill into that to examine, to examine the details of traffic in Denver, I can see a summary view for the site. I can see that I've got packet loss on, at average at 2%, or I'm sorry, at 0.2% with spikes of packet loss uh, as high as 4.7%. While uh, jitter, not what, jitter levels, while not great, are not critically bad either. Um, and so what I might do is drill into this to examine in more detail what's happening in terms of IP transport and traffic coming from Den Denver. And if I focus on packet loss and, and sort, sort by packet loss, I can then see that all of the, there's a consistent pattern in traffic from Denver to Boston uh, and high levels of packet loss. You can see 1.9%, uh, sorry, 4.7% packet loss, 4.4, 4.2. And I can, at a click, see this packet loss across the wide area network. And I can conclude that because I've got uh, a phone in Boston, a phone in Denver, I've got instrumentation at LANWAN edge at both of those sites, as it happens. And I can see that there's packet loss uh, coming across the wide area network. Now, what's interesting is that I can also see the QOS, the QOS markings for this traffic. And if I look at just that, I can see that um, what happened was in both directions, from Denver to Boston, we marked that uh, traffic with uh, uh, expedited forwarding. So DSCP 46 essentially, essentially says, treat this voice traffic as critically important. Um, unfortunately, the wide, the wide area network didn't seem to follow the rules. So it might be a service provider, it may be misconfiguration on the part of the organization, um, but the traffic as it crossed the wide area network was reset to no priority at all. 
best effort. So a, a DSCP zero is a, a best effort uh, uh, setting. And so while we're treating the traffic as important in the local area network, we're not doing so in the wide area network. And so this may be, it's not necessarily true, but it may be the source of the packet loss that's coming across the, the wide area network. Now, a different sort of problem might be what we see at the, the Toronto Gateway, where we see uh, my third most significant or most prevalent issue is this echo problem through the, the Toronto Gateway. And at the, if I follow the link in the event summary, it's going to give, it's going to slice through the data to examine just the streams, just the flows that, that illustrate this problem. So I'm already, this intelligent workflow uh, narrows the scope of my focus to just what I, just what's relevant for me to investigate this problem. And so I can see the handful of streams that, that uh, exhibit this behavior, and I can see that I've got high echo loss and a, and a consequent uh, poor conversational quality, CQ. So CQ at 2.3, 2.4 um, really is significantly degraded, and we've got critical, critical levels of echo loss in traffic uh, between the session border controller and the Toronto Gateway. And if I, again, look at the, the network visualization on this, it gets a little more complicated than what we saw in the past. In this case, we've got the session border controller that divides the external segment of the network from the internal area of the network. But in this case, I've got a call center in Buenos Aires uh, getting traffic through the Toronto Gateway and the Toronto get Gateway is the source of echo. So I, by looking at both directions on the conversation, I can see that the device that's either the source of echo or mismanaging echo is the Toronto Gateway. And if I look at the payload uh, analysis, the application layer analysis, I can see that everything else is perfectly healthy. I've got uh, healthy voice levels. I've got healthy signal-to-noise ratios. Um, but this echo in Toronto produces a conversational quality problem for the, calls, the contact center agent in Buenos Aires. So essentially what, you, what I've shown you here is how easy it is to move from high level views in, in the monitor screen, looking at particular sites, particular technology segments, um, to the troubleshooting world where I, I get into the details of the underlying uh, root cause for the performance issues. At the same time, however, some of the other interfaces in the product allow us to say, oops, so if I'm a call, a call center or help desk, uh, if, I'm, if I'm responsible for help desk in terms of the, re, the reactive response to end users, I can say, show me the performance uh, from a user at extension 301. So the user at extension 301 has called me and, and said, look, I've, I've been on a number of calls today. Uh, they've all been terrible. Um, you know, can you help me? And the, the help desk engineer can look for that particular phone number and see all of the traffic over the, the recent period, over the recent day, the recent uh, few days, recent week. Um, in this case, we can see that for uh, March 19th, we see that um, this party at 301, extension 301, received a number of off-net calls. We see the 555 uh, uh, dialing area code uh, indicates that uh, these are off-net calls. And in all, in all cases, we see that the media gateway produced a high level of echo. And if I look at the visualization on this, we're, 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 we've now got a different workflow that gets me to the same conclusion, that the Toronto gateway is mishandling echo. It may be a faulty gateway, it may be a misconfigured gateway, but certainly it narrows the focus on which device uh, is responsible and which calls were affected by this, uh, by this performance issue. Now, the help desk agent may need to uh, arm a trouble ticket. And this, let me... He can see at a glance that the only performance issue with the gateway is the echo problem. So other other issues, IP transport, voice level, 
uh, listening quality are all healthy. Uh, but we offer a, a plain text description of the problem. Toronto Gateway is consistently producing a lot of echo. We can also identify who needs to be alerted to this issue. In this case, the target audience for such an alert would be the Media Gateway Group. And so this, this uh, information can be cut and paste okay, into a problem ticket. Now, the flip side of the way that we leverage historical data is the proactive view. And in this, in this view, uh, what I'm alerted to is that this is a, a more detailed presentation of what you saw in the main dashboard, in the monitor screen, where you see a, an ordered list of these, the, the most prevalent and ongoing issues. So we can see that 819 streams, or 58% of the traffic coming out of Denver, was affected by that IP transport problem, the packet loss that was occurring across the wide area network. While a, a, a slight, slightly less prevalent issue um, is the traffic coming through a Toronto gateway. As you might imagine, a misperforming uh, gateway will have a widespread effect on many locations, on many users. Um, while something less significant would be IP transport for uh, same t IBM same time soft clients in London. Down, down at the bottom where some 80 streams were affected in such a, such a case. So what this does is it allows responder groups, the, the third-tier engineers, to identify priorities. Which, which, which problems can I address today or this week that are going to be, uh, that have the biggest bang for the buck? And lastly, the reporting provides different kinds of reports for different sorts of audiences. So uh, executive summary reports by location or even by, uh, by organization uh, might be something like uh, the dashboard report where I can see this is traffic. I, I had actually had a, applied a filter for that echo issue. And here we can see in summary view that IP transport is in the green, that voice levels are healthy, but I've got a large number of streams with echo, and that echo loss is critical. So let me expand the view just slightly so I've got more data or broader, broader, uh, broader perspective. So in this case, across the board, all technologies, I can then have a view. I can see how many uh, calls and video sessions were, were launched, how many of those sessions were unhealthy. I can also look at the at uh, it's an executive summary report that compares performance of voice and video services for the near period, the last two days, versus a longer period. Whoops. I think where I've got a longer period of time. And I guess one other report I find terrifically important is the event summary report, which in some respects is a, is a service level uh, report looking at the history of outages or the number of events, uh, categorizing those events. Were they IP transport related outages? Were they uh, application layer outages like echo or noise or voice level? Um, you see the overall utilization of the traffic, so the number of streams, both voice and video. And the pattern of outages or events in time, both as from the perspective of sources of, uh, of issues as well as destinations. So uh, what sorts of issues are users experiencing and where did they come from? Some other useful things. Some other useful reports would be business level reporting that allow me to compare performance of individual sites. 
So which sites are my healthiest? Which sites are my, my least healthy? Which ones require my attention? And in this case, we have an alphabetical list of sites um, in, their in their overall performance due to IP network and application performance. And lastly, there are a, a, a slew of reports that are helpful for operations. Um, what I think that is always surprising for folks is this uh, codec report, looking at the distribution and utilization of different sorts of codecs. Uh, I often find that it, it, folks are surprised to discover that they're using codecs they, that they hadn't expected, um, that they thought that they locked down their uh, communications on a particular codec or set of codecs, and yet there are still traffic that, that uh, aren't following the, following the rules in essence. Uh, so in this case, we can see that a modest percentage of my traffic is utilizing, uh, uh, is not using the high def H.264 video, but, a, but, uh, but it's a, a small percentage. So 3% of my traffic is util utilizing the lesser, a lesser quality H.263. And here I can see that most of my voice traffic is G729, uh, but I've got uh, some Microsoft real-time audio from Microsoft Link, as well as some other other strays. AAC LG would be voice codecs for video conferencing in essence. And we can see is there a particular codec that's less well performing than others. So we can compare the performance of one codec to another. We can see that AAC LG traffic is, is uh, perfectly healthy while there tends to be a, a performance issues with the real-time audio traffic. Now, that's not to blame Microsoft necessarily, but it gives me a hint uh, that I might want to investigate. Uh, there would be high value in my investigating what's happening with the Microsoft uh, traffic. So with that, uh, I, that kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to show you today. Um, I think we ought to open up to, to questions in just a moment. Now, in summary, uh, if we go back one slide, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to summarize, we're, we're talking about deep visibility into both network and application performance for voice and for video. This is end-to-end -to -end, uh, call visibility for all user devices, so soft clients, hard phones, conferencing bridges, um, streaming video. Uh, we support all leading UC vendors, um, in, including, the, uh, including various flavors of video from soft client telepresence. And it's a passive solution, so there's no extra load introduced on the network, or certainly it's less than what you might see from an SNMP-based product, um, where we're submitting over the wire only the analyzed results uh, to a central manager. So that, that tends to be a, a small amount of traffic from a probe analyzer to the central uh, manager. And all of this is based on standards, IQ standards, a uh, consistent measuring stick, a consistent uh, language, a consistent point of view cr across IT silos uh, and across uh, the, the multi-vendor environment. So with that, um, we, let's uh, open up for questions. Thank you, Thomas. I've invited our... I invite our attendees to toggle back to the original viewing screen by clicking on full screen button again. If anyone has a question, please type it into the pod in the top left of the main screen. We'll hopefully get to all the questions, but if we do run out of time, we will definitely respond via email. Uh, looks like we have a couple in there already. Uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, I understand your product requires the use of probes. I have a large number of sites. Must I deploy, deploy probes to all of my sites? Uh, this, this is a question that, that almost comes up in every account that I uh, that I touch. I would tell you that uh, no, I don't. I, re I very rarely recommend probes everywhere. Uh, it's, it's I think uh, uh, very rare that someone wants to instrument everywhere. It's an administrative headache. It's a it's a it's a cost issue. Instead, I work very closely with uh, with uh, organizations to identify. The, the highest value propositions. Where can I position probes to get insight um, about various flavors of traffic? So as you might imagine, I start with conferencing bridges because the conferencing bridges generally 
communicate with every remote site in the network. And so from a single point of instrumentation, a single point of view, I get insight into the overall network health for voice and, and for video that's coming from that site. I also get immediate insight into the application layer. So any, any uh, uh, video conferencing unit, t uh, teleconferencing access, soft phone, hard phone, is revealing itself or revealing its health to me by just, just monitoring at the conferencing bridge. So uh, the, the basic strategy is identify high value points in the network that allow the greatest insight into as many technologies, into as, as many uh, endpoint devices as possible. All right, sure. like the, sec the second question is, uh, we perform frequent video multicasts for training. Does your product support multicast video? Sure. Well, that's an interesting question. Multicast video, as you might imagine, what, what, what one cares about is the delivery of video that's arriving at the remote site. And so the, often that, that implies uh, greater instrumentation at the edge or at the, at the far edge. Um, at the same time, there, it may be sufficient to measure uh, what was the health of my video as it left my corporate location or as, as it left my data center, my server, my video server. Because knowing that, uh, measuring that, any, any, any performance issues that then get reported, you know are downstream from the health of video leaving uh, the, the data center. Um, in, some, in some cases, we can be instrumented to monitor um, at uh, the far edge locations. In, in some of my customers who have done this have deployed large numbers of small probes um, and so very, uh, very cost-effective software-only probes, uh, not a full-blown InfiniStream. And those software-only probes uh, are at a much more m modest cost. They don't support as much traffic, uh, but they're certainly sufficient to measure whether and to measure the health of video arriving at that remote campus. So, um, so it's a mixed bag, and I, I think I, I would work with you to define a strategy that's both cost-effective, uh, but uh, you know, provides insight to the, the service delivery for the streaming video. Um, any other questions? Yeah, it looks like we have uh, two more, and then I think we'll call it a day for that. The third question for you is, how might you address voice and video problems with remote staff? Well, I, very similar to the way I, pro I responded to the question number one, uh, in that remote staff generally are, don't have immediate access to your network. More often than not, um, they're accessing via a data center, by a VPN. Uh, and if that's the case, then by instrumenting at that centralized, for lack of a better word, hub, um, that data center becomes a terrific point to, to place a, a probe or to place an instrument to monitor the, the health of traffic, leaving your, your corporate network uh, and arriving from those remote users. So in, in essence, it allows you to defend the borders of your core network, uh, while at the same time providing some insight that can help uh, the remote staff diagnose their own local issues. All right, we got the last question for you. How do you handle secure traffic? Great question, and certainly relevant for anyone in, uh, in the defense area. Um, what I would tell you is that encryption, encrypted traffic, uh, prevents us from performing the deeper uh, application layer diagnostics uh, so that we're not able to measure things like noise or echo or voice level issues. While that's true, it still it does not prevent us from measuring the network health and the network transport delivery. Um, and more often than not, even when some of the, the traffic is encrypted, uh, we find that not all of the traffic is encrypted. So uh, the traffic that's not encrypted on a secure network uh, allow us insight into the overall health of network transport and of the application endpoints that are, that are not performing encryption. Um, so I would admit to you that some of the traffic might be out of our view, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't reduce the, the value of this technology and our ability to, to analyze the overall health of voice and video. And so uh, it, it's finding a, a happy balance 
uh, between what can be monitored and, and how we can monitor it. In time, we're hoping that we will become part of the trusted uh, environment so that we're given access to decryption keys. That tends not to be a very popular option for most folks. Um, so I would say, you know, designing the strategy then becomes designing a solution that gives adequate or sufficient coverage, uh, even if we don't uh, assess 100% of the traffic or uh, or we monitor all the traffic, but not uh, but not in terms of the application performance. All right. Yeah, it looks like all the questions that we have right now. Uh, Thank you, Thomas. That wraps up our presentation of NetScout's voice and video conferencing. IMIX Group would like to thank Thomas and NetScout for sharing his expertise today and Brad Calderon for being on the line as well. Uh, an archive link of this presentation will be sent to you in the next couple of days. In the meantime, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself. My email address is luke, L-U-K-E, dot Baraldi, B as in boy, I-R-O-L, B as in David, I, at imixgroup.com. Thank you for your time, and uh, thanks for your attention. You guys have a great day.